got that. Um, this might be more familiar to at least most of you, I guess, and also to myself, uh, because it's just about the standard IVF procedures. However, there are certain uh, difficulties in those patients which were only partly foreseen, I think. Um, these are the first eight patients uh, with ACH. And as you can see, at the, we started with, with uh, simulation and OPU, uh, oocyte pickup, uh, before uh, they were transplanted. And uh, well, now I can hear myself, I think. Um, so as you can see on uh, the column first there, uh, they are varied between 26 and 37 uh, years uh, at the first pickup. They have reasonable BMI, age, BMI sorry, uh, as Mats pointed out earlier, and only one was non-MRKH patient, and that was a cervical cancer uh, patient who was uh, without recurrency for several years. Um, there, and some of them had uh, neovagina, some of them had uh, self-dilatation, and they were all sexually active uh, and uh, with good success. Um, but if you summarize this, you can see that the, they have a slightly higher age than the usual IVF patient maybe, and they are rather slender, and seven out of eight were MRKH, which has some bearing on the results later on. The problems you can see is that the ovaries are not that easy to visualize, especially before stimulation. Uh, during stimulation, they will be visible sooner or later. But this uh, was really a, a journey back to the early 80s when Dr. Zwickland and myself tried uh, to puncture with ultrasound, first abdominal, transvesically, and then vagin vaginally, which Gothenburg was pioneering on at that time. So uh, luckily enough, I had done that before, but that was uh, 30 years ago or something. Um, some of them uh, were easier to see the ovaries from the abdominal side. Some of them were easier to examine vaginally, but that differed a bit. The phase of the menstrual cycle is uh, somewhat undefined before you see them, because you don't know whether some of them might be anovulatory. You don't uh, know if someone has PCO. And sometimes it's not evident from the vaginal examination either. So um, some convenient parameters to, to look on would be AMH instead of uh, counting follicles, which is the thing we usually do with now so much better uh, equipment than we had in the 80s. The question is whether AMH is reliable in MRKH, and I don't know of any literature of that. I know that it is not involved in the pathogenesis of, of the uh, malformation, but um, you could guess that there could be differences. And of course, uh, simple things like FSH, LH, estradiol, and progesterone just to estimate the phase of the cycle before we start the stimulation. And some of them we had to make repeatedly uh, monitoring and they were taught to test their LH uh, levels in, uh, or not levels, but the positive LH surge by, by uh, urinary tests which worked out fine with, with uh, all of the women, in fact. Don't look too closely on uh, this table. Um, th these are the individual values, and I will see about, do you see that point? It's a li the little blue thing there. Oh, we were lucky with just one who had a luteal phase of, uh, value of progesterone immediately. So. Uh, this lady, we could have started, we didn't, but we could have started uh, directly with, with treatment there. The others are more or less undefined. There is no obvious peak value of LH in, in this visit value. You have um, 
a rather high HMH value in, in one lady there, and you have a somewhat not very low, at least, FSH basal value in one lady. But otherwise, it's, it's fairly uh, normal picture. We choose to use the um, safest way because um, the long agonist protocol is obviously easier to uh, use in these kind of women where you don't really know exactly where you are in the, the cycle. We decide to start in the luteal phase, if possible, seven to nine days post uh, a positive LH value. Um, all the stimulations included uh, HMG, just to make sure we had no WHO1 patients, which wouldn't respond on, on pure FSH, but there were also combinations of HMG and FSH. As, it, as you can see later on, it that was surprisingly difficult to stimulate most of them, uh, which really is in the literature, which we would have read more thoroughly, I think. Uh, so um, many of them had to ha have quite high doses for 10 days or so to, to, enable, to uh, make it possible to harvest a good number of eggs because the aim was to freeze fertilized eggs still uh, to play it safe. Um, in Gothenburg, the tradition uh, to freeze on day two is still very uh, dominating, and we knew uh, we started to do that at least uh, in the first series, and we aimed at having ten good embryos, day two embryos in the freezer in each patient. That was the goal. Short antagonist protocol is of course possible, but then you have to trick a bit, you have to give them progesterone or uh, or a contraception or so, or we could use the kind of crash protocol that we were really the first to describe in Gothenburg and the Danish quite a, just a few months later. Uh, so this is the well-known long agonist protocol where you have to start at least for two weeks preferably in the luteal phase to make uh, the flare-up phenomenon as low as possible. And um, ACG is administered when we have uh, rather many follicles above 18 to 20 millimeters. Um, we also uh, had an old no notion from uh, the 80s, uh, John McBain, in Melbourne, Monash, uh, taught us once uh, to count uh, days of significant estradiol uh, rise. And that was good when you are blinded, you don't see anything on an ultrasound. It's a good uh, thing to uh, look at the estradiol rise, but because when it's gone up for about seven to eight days, if you don't see anything in, in, on ultrasound, then, then, then you are in trouble. But we did in all cases. So then it was pretty easy. And then we went for, for uh, follicles over 18 before we administered ACG and uh, took out the eggs within um, 38 hours after that. In, in our material, there is a dominance for transabdominal puncture. We tried with a full bladder, but that was usually not very helpful in these patients because the ovaries could be quite out of the small pelvis and uh, lateral to the big vessels. So uh, with the today's good ultrasound machines, it's possible to see them quite well when they're stimulated at least and, and reach them that way instead. In local anesthesia, as we always do. In the literature, uh, mostly of Israel origin, uh, that's about um, 10 years uh, experience there. Yeah, I have to apologize. Uh, there should be no hyphen in Ben Raphael, should I? No. Um, but the, the, these uh, data, was, uh, data were, of course, uh, exclusively OPU for surrogacy, but it's the same kind of material anyhow. And uh, in, pr in principle, there were more vaginal punctures in, in, the, in that series. I saw about 100, uh, 110 patients or something. So it's a big material, which we can't really match in, in this case. 
uh, results of stimulation. This is a s also small and it's not meant to be uh, scrutinized in detail, but um, so far all of them have been treated with using an GnRH agonist. First lady has had two stimulatory cycles uh, and reached 13 oocytes, eight fertilized uh, and seven frozen on the day seven as, as a four cell embryo. Number two is five started cycle, two canceled, remains three. Abdominal puncture, the first one was vaginal as you saw, um, oocytes 23. Fertilization only about half, uh, and also all of them, luckily enough, w could be frozen on day two. And um, if you see the doses, you see that they are rather high. If you uh, divide by, by 10 and the number of, uh, of attempts, you will see that they are pretty well over 300 units in about 10 days, and that uh, 11 days maybe and that is quite high in this age group. Um, and so on, so, so it varies, um, but at the end we have um, almost reached the goal in every uh, woman there. We had 7, 11, 11, 13, 12, 12, 10, and 18 uh, embryos frozen on day two. We collaborate with, with a Stockholm group as well, and they have also they have also gone to blastocysts, which has worked fine, and they are frozen on blastocysts stage, and we can compare that in the long run. Just one patient, in spite of the high doses, have uh, had a slight OHSS, but that was uh, cleared off very quickly without any harsh medication. But um, the bottom line is that the high doses have been needed and it's um, known before that if you take MRKH you will land there somewhere. So it would be nice to have very fertile women in, in the series but uh, this uh, sort of women is probably seldom so. Only one with, with the um, OHSS bit has uh, was easy to stimulate and uh, more like the usual patient in Sweden. Uh, so as I said, um, the mostly Israeli data says that there is a tendency to get fewer oocytes, especially what is called a type B. It's a rather coarse uh, under um, group, uh, meaning that you have other malformations, usually kidney malformations, but, but that could be a lot. But that has not been separated so far. Do you? But uh, the majority of our women had at least kidney uh, malformation, so they should be uh, classed as, as type B then. Low fertilization cleavage embryo quality, and of course, um, in the surrogate series, the results were also lower than usual. So that is what we have to ex expect here as well, that we will have to go on for a while because we can, before we can count what success rate we will have. So up to now, it's fewer oocytes and embryos frozen uh, in this group. AMH seems to be, seems at least to be less predictive of the response because they had normal HMH and they uh, still needed quite a lot of stimulation. And the picture was good. I mean, we could see every follicle where we punctured it, so it's not bad. And that seemed to be very low risk for OHSS, but that's uh, also a consequence of the above. And I have to disappoint you there because uh, four patients have now reached the stadium when ET is to be made. And um, therefore I think it's too early, or we think it's too early to present any detailed results of that, but we will come back. Thank you for your attention. Any questions on this? It is, it is interesting, the BMA, the BMI results. All of them are low BMI. Is this is something related to Rokitansky? Because that was my, ex my experience, remembering that there were 
small ladies with yeah. low BMI, because this is a BMI under the population, yeah. certainly, under the mean, I don't know about yeah. Sweden, but certainly for other countries, that's a low BMI. Yeah, well, uh, Swedish ladies still uh, have a reasonable BMI, for how long, I don't know. But, well, we had this, they were also astonishingly beautiful, all of them, but I don't know whether you knew that. It might be related to the syndrome in any way? I don't know, or it's a, it's a selection, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what we did in, uh, in cases of surrogacy, we measured progesterone weekly instead of LH, of not, not to bother them too much. So yeah. once progesterone is high, you start down-regulating and wait two weeks, and then usually it was ready yeah. for, to go. That, uh, that seems to be the easiest way to do it as well. Do you have uh, ongoing pregnancies after these uh, four uh, transfers? I, I said I won't comment on that. Okay. 